Good morning. Try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Good, morning. Woo. Good morning, and to everybody else, too, um, in the other rooms. Um, I uh, am delighted to be here um, because I've already been, I've already learned so much uh, just since last night listening to the discussion here. And um, by the way, uh, Klaus uh, basically was just also summing up the entire United States, right? Except Trump has won. So the far right uh, has split the trade union movement successfully, and it led to the election of a I will try not to curse early on. So, um, but you know, we're in very deep trouble. That may be obvious, and I'm not going to go on, but it's only to say it's a forecast um, of what's coming. Um, and he did it by dividing the working class. Um, so, uh, so Trump is the reality of our country. Uh, Trump is in power precisely because he successfully spoke to the feelings um, of a class of people who no longer have dignity in the United States, which is basically the working class, right? And he spoke to the white working class with very coded language about, I respect you, right? And it was very effective. And I was one of only a handful of people in the US who actually predicted that he would win, predicted it publicly, predicted it out loud. Um, and I knew that because I was working with a set of unions where it was very, very clear if you were in the, because I was organizing, right? Meaning I was out running a huge campaign with thousands of workers. And I was in Pennsylvania, which is our, one of our swing states, we call it. And it's a state that Trump won. It was one of three he won that was traditionally a working class controlled political state. So I was running a huge union campaign. So I was in the field with thousands of workers in 2016. I was not working on the presidential race because I couldn't stand Hillary Clinton, so I couldn't bring myself to work on the presidential race. I was doing my work, though, which was building the rank and file base. And in the field, on the doors, as we went door to door to do house calls in a union organizing campaign with thousands of workers, it was super clear to me that Donald Trump was gonna win. Um, so this is a very serious issue. And if we run away from this hard conversation inside of the trade union movement, we will have a far right party. So we cannot run away from it. So I just want to echo all of the things that you said. I want to talk about how we beat it. I like to talk about how we're going to do it. Um, I think Klaus did a great job of outlining um, the problem. So but before I get rolling, I want to say just two things. One is I want to thank the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for doing a ridiculously wicked translation of that book. Um, it was so fast. It was crazy. Uh, so Flo and Fanny, I think, worked their tails off um, at the foundation. Uh, Jan Peter is, yeah. Yeah. Um, Jan Peter uh, definitely worked his tail off and still is right up there in the translation booth translating a book in record time. Oxford University Press said to me they've never seen a book translated this fast in the history of Oxford University. So, um, just saying. Talk lower. Wegen dem, der Lautstärke. Ne? Ihr könnt die alle selber regulieren. Eure Kopfgeräte einfach den Ton hochdrehen. Yeah, okay. Try and talk lower. Um, and the last uh, person I want to sort of just thank before I go on, uh, who, part of the, really the reason I'm here, I think, is Luigi um, here, Wolf, uh, who persistently started emailing me and emailing me and emailing me and emailing me. And on like the hundredth email, I was like, Jesus, who is this guy? Um, so, um, and. And he, he actually, the picture that finally really captured my attention, because I was in the middle of running a big campaign, was a picture he sent with a whole bunch of activists holding up my book and reading it in a group somewhere in Germany. And I was like, who are these people? Anyway, so um, thank you for, for inviting me here. Um, so I want to talk about, uh, the title of my talk briefly is Strikes as Structure Tests which I'm gonna explain um, uh, pretty much the whole time. Um, and if anyone wants to read uh, more about it, um, this article just came out in a journal called Catalyst slash Jacobin. Both of them re-ran it, so there's a recent article. This is actually the graphic that's called the strike is the ultimate structure test. And I'm gonna talk about the role of strikes in defeating the far right. The two are completely uh, intrinsically linked. We have to go back to having mass strikes, and by mass I mean 100% out, 
I'm gonna clarify what I mean by a strike. I mean 100% of workers out, which is what we do. And I'm gonna show you some pictures of recent 100% out strikes. Because when we are forced to think about how do we get to 100% out strike, that's a super majority strike, we strike with no less than 95%. That's our rule, no less than 95%. When we have to do that, that's what we have to do in the US to survive a strike, because we have so many anti-strike laws. Um, so if you think about it, the whole logic of what I'm about to lay out of how we do it, how do we get to 95 to 100% out strikes, it's because we have to make a plan to talk to every single worker. Every worker has to talk to every single worker. And in the process of every worker having to talk to every single worker, to the tune of hundreds of thousands, millions, et cetera, it means that we're unearthing and dealing straight with the very hard conversations among people who don't want to talk to us and aren't coming to our meetings, which might be people who are going for the AFD. They're probably not showing up at a radical union meeting, or a union meeting for that matter, right? So the point of organizing the way I'm going to talk about it and the point of all-out strikes is it forces us to methodically go and have conversations, meaning with every single worker. We then identify where we have people who might be breaking Trump for sake of argument, right? Or where these conversations are happening. So strikes force us into a very tight method. Um, and to me, that's why they matter so much. Um, I'll just say one second about uh, who is the strange person from the US here. Um, I'm the daughter of a trade union leader uh, turned politician, put into office by politics. This is me. I was on the back of every Volkswagen and every car in America, no, for, in New York for a long time. So when I grew up on picket lines, my mother died when I was really little. So I literally got parked on picket lines my whole childhood. Um, so that's just a, so learning how to count tight elections, like tight political races, was what I learned to do as a child. And then I was usually just parked with a picket line or a voting precinct. And both of them matter to me to defeat the far right um, and to win things that are much better uh, for um, the working class. So um, the theme of what I want to talk about is high participation. The whole next 20 something minutes, I'm gonna talk about how do we build high participation? because it's with high participation that we get to mass strikes. By mass, I mean, again, no less than 95% out. So I like to say high participation is a prerequisite to working class power. We cannot have maximum power without maximum participation by workers in their own struggle. Um, so, but having maximum participation is not enough in the era that we're in right now with contested ideologies um, and right-wing uh, populism dominating. We also have to have um, unity among and between workers and the working class, uh, we, unity against division. Um, we have to have what we call a really tight structure, a tight, effective worksite structure from which we can grow out into the broader community to do our work. Um, and we have to have what, what we call demonstratable supermajorities. By demonstratable, I mean visible. We're constantly presenting that we're supermajorities to the employer in a lead up to a strike. And I'm gonna talk about why we do that for the rest of my time, how we do it and why we do it. So I wanna say the really good news in the United States, cause you know there's plenty of bad, I don't have to tell you about the bad news. The really good news in the United States is this. Um, is that in 2018, I heard last night, listening to the speeches, that you're, on, you're having a rise in strikes. And I heard a little bit about the Ige Metal one. I've been hearing about some other strikes. I was, it was great hearing about the folks from the food workers th this morning, listening to them at 95%. I was having a dream because they were talking about 95% numbers, which was great. Um, because 95% is one of my favorite numbers, if not 100. <laughs> so um, so we're have, we had more strikes in 2018 in the United States than we've had in five decades, four decades. Um, we literally had more workers out on strike and more massive strikes than we've had, in my, not my lifetime exactly, but since the early 1970s um, in some real ways. And, I, and what, what began it was um, a, a massive education strike, and it was not just teachers. It gets talked about as teachers. It was teachers, bus workers, cooks, classifieds, and I want to say right up front, um, that the West Virginia, what's called the West Virginia teacher strike was the West Virginia education strike. And what's super clear from me being down there and working with people is that they couldn't have won the strike without the bus drivers refusing to drive the buses so that the kids could not get to school. So solidarity between 
right, and among the quote-unquote professional class and the quote-unquote working class, not designations I care much for, the worker solidarity together is what shut down the entire state of West Virginia. So we started out with 34,000 on strike. By the way, the entire strike was illegal. Teachers do not have the right to strike in that state. Does it look like they don't have it? The next, the next strike, the next strike, there were a couple small ones. There were little teachers going in Oklahoma and a few other states. The next big one was in Ari the state of Arizona. That's 75,000 teachers shut the state down, an illegal strike. They have no right to strike. You don't have to clap for all of them because there's a bunch, so forget it. It's just exciting. So the next illegal strike... Um, was in North Carolina. This is one of my favorite pictures. You can see the power holders just shitting their pants, right? Looking out the window at them. So that was an illegal strike. Um, and two of these are in the South, right? And these are all states that are called right to work states where members join or don't join, just like here. Um, and they're all illegal. Then uh, in the fall, we shifted from education strikes to, you might recognize this picture. It's the cover of the translated book. I was very happy to put it there. Um, this is from a great day on the picket lines at Marriott. Um, these were hotel workers who launched a multi-state, seven-state, seven-city, all-out strike by so-called low-wage work, so-called low-wage, so-called unskilled workers, took on one of the biggest multinational companies in the world and beat them. And in sociological debates in my country, uh, they say that, low, well, this might work for nurses and stuff, but it won't work for low-wage workers. Okay, well, screw it, because this is low-wage workers taking on a giant multinational corporation because they were 100% out with the community behind them, and they won a massive series of strikes across the country. That was the fall. <laughs> and finally pride and joy discussion for the moment uh, is the strike that we just won, which was in Los Angeles, California, where 34,000 teachers, 100% of the teachers walked out. 34,000 teachers in the second largest city in the United States of America, which is Los Angeles. Um, they got the worst weather in the history of Los Angeles, torrential storms, total downpours. No one could believe how bad the weather was and still 65,000 people, that means 34,000 plus twice that with parents and students supporting them, 65,000 people occupied the city, the center of the city, the, the governmental city hall plaza, um, every single day for six days in an open-ended strike until they won. So it was open-ended, hardest strikes we do, right? Open-ended, no designated period, not 24 hours, not two hours. This was we're going out till we win. And that strike was just one. Uh, two weeks ago, um, and I spent um, some good amount of time in Los Angeles, including on the Victory Day, um, and sat in all the meetings when the workers were voting to ratify their agreement, um, and it was totally insane. So uh, strikes are happening in a way they haven't been happening in a very long time, um, and thank God uh, in the United States. So I want to shift to um, just a couple, there's a, just a couple slides with words, and I'm going to go back to pictures and talk through the, how we do this. How, how do we actually build to 100% out strike, which is what I have spent my life doing, um, is running 100% out strikes. So mostly in the, I work mostly with hospitals and nurses in the healthcare sector by tradition, um, but I also spend a lot of time in the education sector. And I want to note, by the way, that both of the sectors that I've carved my union negotiation and organizing experience in are women-led um, professions. Um, and women-heavy professions. And someone said something earlier I thought was interesting. I have to say, I know we're talking about specific women's strikes, because that's a good thing, um, but almost every strike that I've ever had the pleasure of leading was also a women's strike, because almost every worker in it was a woman. Um, and they went out 100% on strike, right? Which is healthcare workers and a lot of education workers. So the five core concepts I want to mention, um, which I'll just show some pictures of, um, is one, um, Structure versus self-selecting, and I'll explain that slide in a minute. Just a key concept is structure-based organizing versus what I call self-selected organizing, which is where you post something on Facebook and say, come to a meeting, and it's an environmental issue or a woman's thing or a Occupy Wall Street or something like that. Um, so structure-based organizing is where we have a set number of people. It's a workplace, right? It's a structure where you can count. Are 100% of the people in this constituency participating or not? 
It's a key to structure-based organizing. So I'm going to talk again. I'll show another slide about that in a minute. Um, the second core concept um, is what I call leaders versus activists. Um, organic leaders uh, is what I mean. Um, informal organic leaders uh, is a method and approach to the work that we do, which I distinguish from an activist approach, a sort of militant minority approach, where we're never actually talking to all the workers. Um, my, ex my life experience is that we can't we can't get to 100% out strike if we're using an activist approach to the workplace. We can get to 100% out strikes if we're using what I call the organic leader um, approach to the workplace. And I'll talk more about each of them. Um, uh, what it leads to, um, doing structure-based organizing with what I call the organic leader approach to the work um, is what leads to majorities, super majorities versus minorities. Uh, because we need, in an era of the far right, to be talking to everybody. That's the point. Um, and we have to have a method to do it. And I'm going to run through the methods uh, before I sit down. Um, the fourth is an approach to the broader community that I call whole worker organizing. This is all in the book. Um, called whole worker organizing, which I contrast with sort of labor community alliances. By which I mean there's a... On a good day in the United States and some of the unions, there's sort of a top-down thing like head of union goes to meet head of community-based group. That's a top-down approach to the community. Um, whole worker organizing is very much approach that's grounded in the rank and file themselves. It's about workers tapping into their own relationships and their own communities and then being system us being systematic about how workers bring their entire community into the strike and into the struggle with them. So it's a contrast between a top-down and a bottom-up approach to how unions work in the community. Um, and for me, all of that adds up adds up to the theory, essentially, of the book, of this book, um, which is organizing versus mobilizing. So um, if we're doing a sort of, uh, if, if all we do is sort of an Occupy Wall Street approach to the world, which is like a self-selecting, like we bring together the people who already agree with us. That's what self-selecting is. You bring together people who already agree with you. Um, and, uh, and that's a bunch of activists, and we like each other, and we like talking to each other, and we're fun together, and we feel good. Um, that adds up to something called the mobilizing model. And if we do a top-down community approach as unions, we get a sort of mobilizing approach. We've, in, we've, we've involved people, we're having protests, but we're actually not involving all people. By contrast, if you do structure-based organizing, where you can actually count how many people, if I've got 1,000 people in this workplace, in a structure-based situation, if we're doing our work right, we're actually tracking every day. Have we talked to 400 people, 600 people, 800 people, or 1,000? We know whether or not we're talking to all 1,000 in a structure-based environment. And the only way to do that, to scale, because we really, the work I did in the progressive trade union movement, we don't actually have as many staff uh, as we would dream about having. So um, who can do that work are the actual organic leaders are the leaders themselves who are in the workplace. That's who can actually do the work. Our job is to identify them, and off they go, and they're going to bring hundreds and tens of thousands and a hundred thousands more with them. So that's the organic leader approach, um, and it builds majorities in the workplace environment. Majorities, not minorities, um, of participants. Um, and to me, the, then there's the bottom-up whole work organizing. We won't really have time for that today. I was just noting that there's, a, there's an equally systematic approach to the community. Um, and all of that adds up to organizing. Um, and that's a very different model. And you may have heard um, a lot about organizing, the organizing model. Who's heard, who heard the term the organizing model from the America before? Yeah, some hands, right? So um, the truth is, um, the whole argument of my that second book is that the people who used the word the organizing model in the US were actually doing a mobilizing model. They weren't actually doing an organizing model because an organizing model is about something different um, and it's about building power. Um, so, um, yeah. So, um, the point, let me go back to this. Yep, okay. I'm going to do this slide quickly because I sort of said it. But this is the structure versus self-selecting, right? I'm just sort of putting it out on a slide again. Structure-based organizing is the workplace, but it can also be a mosque, a church, a synagogue, fill in the blank. It can also be a housing development or a housing complex. Any place where you've got a set number of people from which you can count, are we at super majorities or are we actually not reaching most people? Do the same 30 people show up at our meeting every time we meet? Or do we have actually go from 30 to 60 to 90 to 200 to 2,000, right? That's what we're trying to do in a structure-based approach. 
Um, and then self-selecting is, again, you know, it's all very good. I'm not, I'm not dissing it, but I, I don't mean to say something bad about self-selecting. It's just not adequate. It's not enough to only talk to people who agree with us. The job is to talk to everyone who doesn't agree with us. That's what organizing actually is. Um, so, and those are all examples, again, of what I call the self-selecting model. Um, and the question is, you know, are we building majorities or not? And that's what we need to do to stop the far right and the AFD um, and Donald Trump um, and fill in the blank in whatever country we're in. So again, just to contrast now on what I mean by the organic leader, um, the key to the methods, I'm going to go to methods right now, the key to the methods of like, how do we do this? It's very methodical. I didn't invent it, by the way. I inherited it from people in the 1930s in my country in the trade union movement. I'm a, I'm a third generation descendant of a very smart 1930s trade union in the United States. The people who trained me were trained by the people in the 1930s. So we call that third direct lineage from the best organizers in the country in the trade union movement. And they had this approach um, to the work. They had an organic leader kind of approach to the work, a, a mass participation approach. So understanding the difference between who in the workplace is an organic leader versus who is an activist is fundamental to getting to a 100% out strike. And strikes are fundamental to beating the right. So, um, and the, the core method to how we do it is called leader identification and structure tests. Hence the talk is the strike is the ultimate structure test. So we do a series of what we call structure tests, which is testing um, how strong is our structure? How effective is our structure? Do we have a way in one, in, in one hour if we need to, to get word out through a giant factory or a giant workplace or 900 schools in a city or however many 75,000 teacher schools were in Arizona? Can we actually communicate with every single worker face to face? And I don't mean Facebook, I mean face to face in a workplace in the course of one hour. That's a tight and effective structure, and that's what we have to build. Um, so now I'm going to go into the methods, spend the, the last bit of time on the methods. So um, this is something that we call um, a big wall chart. Um, and a big wall chart is not quite that big, though sometimes we make them that big. And that wall chart, this is one hospital. It's a recent campaign I was running in Philadelphia, city in America. It's in a hospital. So I'm just going to give you a hospital wall chart as an example. But we do this for every kind of workplace there is, grocery store, factory, whatever. Um, so this is one department, surgical intensive care unit, in one hospital. Um, and we start on this chart by putting all the workers' names. Remember, because it's not who comes to our meeting. That's not whose names are on here. We just have a list of every single worker who works in that department. And we put their names in hand, and handwriting matters, because this is a method that's teaching rank and file workers themselves how to do the work. It's not about top-down staff professionals controlling it. It's about how do we teach workers to build a tight and effective structure, which is what this is, which is why it's not a computer database. It's not a computer printout. It matters that people think they don't need a computer to do this, right? If we thought every worker needed to do Excel spreadsheets, we'd be screwed. Because most workers don't like Excel spreadsheets and databases, last I looked. So having this method actually really matters. I'm still using this method for a reason. And young organizers in my country, when I first meet them, they're like, oh yeah, Jane, we don't really do that anymore. You know, we, we just print out the list and then we go meet with the worker. And I say to them, what message did you just teach the worker when you walk in with the only list, you show it to them and then you take it away? What did you just teach the workers? That you're important, they're not, and that you're going to control the knowledge about who's a member, who's not, and who's taking action and who's not. This method is about empowering the rank and file to build their own workplace structure, which is why I'm very attached to it. So every worker is up here. And then um, every yellow symbol and dot next to their name uh, indicates a different structure test. And all we do is structure test. And I'm going to show you structure tests in a minute. So, but for example, the blue dot means that this worker signed the authorization card to form a union. The green dot means that they, uh, they sign something called the vote yes petition. That's a public petition that their boss is going to see before the union election that says, I'm ready to stand in your face and step on you instead of you stepping on me and vote yes for the union. The red one says that they signed a public negotiations petition. So also public, their employer is going to see it, the bosses will see it. This is, about, this is about getting workers comfortable with taking risk, part of the process. 
The yellow one means they filled in a contract action survey because we will survey 100% of the workers going into, the, um, going into a contract. But first we have to win the election and then we work on the contract. So, so each of them, the yellow, and this is over six months, this chart. So these all come later. This is about six months of work in one unit in one hospital. Um, uh, and I don't, uh, they're all different structure tests. But so each one of those dots is something that the workers are doing themselves. Okay, so here's labor and delivery. Um, you might notice from looking at this, a different department, it's a little less good than the first one, right? There's a little more space, a little more white space, not every worker is participating equally. This is how the workers in labor and delivery know they have some problems. There are some people who are not participating in labor and delivery, and the workers in labor and delivery are going to start trying to figure out how to get them together. But if you look, again, you can tell, right? If every, if every department in the world looked like this, you'd be ready for 100% out strike all over the world. This is what we want every workplace to look like, is this chart. We had strong leadership leading their coworkers in the union. Labor and delivery, okay. Now, what's happening in this unit? Anyone, what's happening in that unit? Thank you, not a lot. Great English, thank you so much. There's really not, there's really not, if you said that in German, I would have guessed that's what you're saying, but right, there's not a lot happening. This is the same time period in the same hospital in the same fight. We've got a problem in this unit. Every worker knows it because they're analyzing their charts, and every worker understands we were having a very big problem. The vote no committee to kill the union was being run out of this unit called telemetry. It was, it was the heart of the boss's campaign of division against workers against workers. In fact, it doesn't look nearly as bad in this picture. I'm sorry I didn't take it the day before. I was, had my organizer hat on, not my sociology hat on that day. Um, this is actually a victory picture because, in fact, in fact, um, all this yellow represents a victory because it means they eventually finally signed union membership cards. Um, and it's because we finally identified the actual organic leader. In this unit, the person called the organic leader, who's named Marnay Payne, I can't reach her here, she's up in the middle, Marne Payne, had run the anti-union crusade for four and a half straight months in this campaign, and I mean vicious, effective, vicious, um, vote no to the union, vote no to the union, vote no to the union, completely anti-union, um, and I understood that as the organizer, if we couldn't eventually convert her to become pro-union, 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 we could never have 100% out strike in that hospital. And to strike in America, we have to have 100%, so we have a problem. And this is how we get to 100%. We wouldn't leave that unit alone until we could win over the actual organic leader who had stopped every worker from signing union cards. She was that powerful, one worker. Hated the union, and when anyone approached any other worker in that unit, you know what they would say? Yeah, no. Did you talk to Marnay? Because if Marnay signs the card, then I'll sign the card. But if Marnay, doesn't, if Marnay doesn't sign that card, I'm not signing that card. That's the identification of the organic leader. And that's why the activist model doesn't work for us. Because if we only relied on the people who liked us, we don't get to this, right? If we only talked to people who came to our meetings, Marnay was never going to come to a meeting. We had to go knock on her door, drive to her house, surround her, find her. Like, we had to go at her over and over and over. And in getting Marnay finally to decide that she was pro-union, she didn't just become pro-union. She signed up everyone in yellow. She did that in one hour. <laughs> so she got 100% sign up the day she signed her membership card in one hour. It took her weeks to do that in the other units, right? One hour, she walked in and said, okay, 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 I get it, okay, I get it, we're gonna make really good things happen here, and sign the card now. And she's so specific that when I was meeting with her, she, I remember I said to her, are you ready to go talk to your coworkers now to, to change the whole situation? And she said, yes. And then I watched her go like this, literally, this is how effective she is, top nurse, really smart nurse, and she starts to do this, counting. And I was quiet, waiting. I don't know what she, she's gonna say something to me. And she said, and then this one who's spitting at us, like yelling, screaming, spitting, saying superlatives on Facebook, saying, kill the union. Um, and she said, 34. And I actually knew what she meant, but I didn't want to say that. So I said, 34 what? And she said, there's 34 people at work, so give me 34 cards. And she walked in and got 34 people to sign membership cards. And the only reason it wasn't 100% is because hospitals are a split shift, right? She had to come back the next day to get the rest of the unit. So this unit went to 100% before any other unit. And then three months into our negotiations later, she led, led 
the vote yes to strike vote in a massive hospital in Philadelphia. That's the difference in approach to the work, right? We have to go get her. That's what organizing is. That's not mobilizing. Mobilizing wouldn't ever get to Marnay. It would leave her unit as a bad unit, to be honest. Just to be honest. Plenty of people I know in the labor movement would just lift, screw that unit. Because the only difference about why we believed we had to go flip Marnay, help her come to her own understanding. It's very important words. Help Marnay come to her own understanding that her own position was actually wrong and bound up in austerity, right-wing messaging in the media, everything that got put in her brain about why a union was bad. She had to come to her own conclusion. No one could tell her she was wrong. Well, you can't tell a worker who's dug into her position she's wrong. We had to take a series of actions that helped her begin to understand that in fact she was on the wrong side. And the only reason that it mattered to the philosophy of the work I come from, which is organizing, it's what separates us from mobilizing, is because we knew the only way to win a damn good contract, first collective agreement, in that hospital would require a 100% out strike because the boss wasn't gonna give them an inch of money or an inch of power. And we didn't go into that organizing campaign to settle for crap, right? We went into that campaign, workers' expectations were raised, they wanted staffing standards, they wanted staffing ratios, they wanted equipment that worked when they walked into the emergency department to save a patient and the crap that was falling apart and not working. They wanted their equipment working, they wanted better raises, they wanted staffing standards. And I said to them all along, if that's what you want against this employer, who's a union-busting SOB who brought in the top union-busting firm in America called IRI Inc. to fight us, I said to the workers, you can win that kind of contract with a strike. You're gonna to have to strike for your first contract. And if you're ready to strike for your first contract, then you can win an amazing contract. And that means you, workers, have to go figure out how to move Marnay Payne and telemetry. Because if you don't move Marnay Payne and telemetry, you ain't having a strike and you're not gonna get staffing standards. That's your work, not mine, right? My job is just to teach them how to chart, how to understand how to do it. So, what are the structure tests? What are all these crazy, and that's the workers working on their charts, they become their charts, they take them home, that's at a big meeting. Um, so what are all these structure tests? Uh, I'm gonna give you a quick few examples and then, um, and then, um, and then I'm gonna be done. So, the structure tests, um, they always start out as simple hand sign petitions. Um, I can't, obviously give a whole organizing class right now. I'm just trying to give you a teaser of like, how do we get to 100% out strikes? And 100% out strikes make us talk to every worker. And actually it turns out workers can change their opinions from anti-union to pro-union, from Donald Trump uh, to Bernie Sanders. I won't say that other name. So, um, so uh, uh, we start with a lot of hand-signed, always for me the rule that I was taught is hand-signed petitions. The petitions are short and simple. These are all the words that are on the petition, like we want a great contract, you know, we stand united for a great contract. I do not mean what the left does. I do not mean 25 gazillion words on a piece of paper. I mean a simple petition with three sentences. It's very hard for us to do that, I know, a lot of the times. You don't need every fact ever about the contract on the petition, just three sentences. And then we hand the petition to the organic leader or the person that we think from their workers is the organic leader. And we hand it to them uh, and we say you've got five days to get 100% of your unit. So it's unit by unit, workplace by workplace. This is how they just had 34,000 teachers out on strike in Los Angeles. They did all of this. So we start with this because it's not social media, it's not Facebook, it's not sign on in the dotted line. We're testing our worksite structure, the foundation of the house of power, and whether or not we will have 100% out strikes is, is our worksite structure powerful? And each one of these hand-signed petitions tests which units we're strong in, which units we're weak in, and therefore prioritizes for all of the workers on the organizing committee where they have a lot of work to do to get it to 100%. What we don't spend any time doing is talking to the already pro-union workers. No, sorry. 
If you're a pro-union worker, you're not going to get talked to. You're going to come to a big meeting because you will come. Um, or you're involved in trying to win over the units where we have a problem. So that's what the structure test, the dots you saw in the charts are. Each one of them is some kind of actual test that lets us test and assess the workplaces, factories, schools, hospitals, fill in the blank, which ones are strong and in good shape, which ones are weak, where there might be a far right wing base being built, where we have to go do some work. Because we have to get to 100% conversation with the working class to rebuild the kind of solidarity um, that we need. So that's another example, different hospital, different campaign, it's a bunch of workers. And what we do when we make them big, we get the hand signed little petition, then you mount them on big placards, then you do what's called the march on the boss, and the workers march it up to the CEO and slam it on the CEO's desk at a lunchtime action to show the boss that they're united and to put all the signatures forward this is like a 95% petition to start letting the CEO know in a contract talks, we're totally united in this hospital. And if you don't surrender, you're going to see a strike. And we don't have to say it. We just show it. Here's all the signatures. And they're not scared to show them to you and they're marching them to your office. So it's demonstrable supermajorities. And it's allowing us to fine tune where we're weak. They're just endless. We just do them constantly. That's why I say constant structure tests. These are all different supermajority petitions. Um, this is this big campaign in Philadelphia um, where they won. Where Mar this is Marnay's hospital. Um, and there were a thousand nurses in that hospital and they were about to march upstairs. And by the way, if, if I held the camera, I was getting dragged out. But there were like 50 security guards about one minute later as they went up to the confront the CEO of the hospital. Um, so that's it. And then we start to... Uh, and then we just start to escalate them because a strike is the ultimate one. So then you do photo posters, supermajority. Then you move into negotiations, supermajority. A few more pictures. Supermajority. Um, so this is me leading negotiations. Um, my goal in negotiations is to get every worker to come into the room at least once, just for an hour or two. So I bargain with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of workers at once in the room. Um, and they're a structure test. We have a dot on that chart. Has every worker showed up to see what's, and this is not normal. Let me just tell you something. That does not happen in most of the United States of America at all. So um, these are all negotiations. Um, I was trained to lead negotiations with thousands of workers at a time, and that's what I do. Um, so that's actually workers in negotiations with the employer. Two more minutes, seconds. Um, a key to it is that we, we then, once the unity is strong, we begin to move the negotiations into the community. This is in a powerful black church in the city of Philadelphia that we identified the black church. If he called up the mayor or the politicians in the city, they would crap in their pants. They were so scared of this black minister. And we had a member in his church, and so we strategically look at the map. We do a map about where they go to churches, for example. Um, and we move the actual formal negotiations into the community so that we begin to bond with the community organically through the rank and file members. Um, so that's negotiations, that's negotiations. Okay, that's article committees, second to last one. This is, um, this is a structure test. This was the mock, mock strike vote at the Chicago Teachers Union, which was a massive strike in 2012 in America. This is the teacher union leader. And this was a meeting she called right before they were going to take a strike vote because they had a law change to say you had to have 75% participation in the vote for the vote to be a legal strike ballot. So they had to fill this hall three times in one day to know that they had 100% of workers ready to go out on strike, and they did. So... I have a closing, my closing uh, comment, because I forgot to say it earlier, is this. The point of a strike, brothers and sisters, I just want to say what the point of a strike is in my world experience. It is not to be militant. The point of a strike is not to be militant. The point of a strike is to win. The point of a strike is to rebuild class consciousness. The point of a strike is to clarify in a confusing consciousness era with a right-wing populace saying pensions matter but only for the white people or whatever it is in our country too, right? The point of the strike is to clarify more than any other weapon I have ever used that there are actually only two sides. There's us and them and there's nothing in between. And a strike clarifies it like nothing ever. It's to stop the advance of the far right. 
It's to build unbreakable class solidarity, which every strike I've ever witnessed or led or been on does. Unbreakable working class solidarity, because you're in struggle together, and the boss is the enemy. And it's going to change the politics if we do it a lot more. Thank you so much.